Good evening. My name is Guy Lancaster, and I serve as the editor of the Online Encyclopedia of Arkansas, which is a pet project, a, pet, a project of the Central Arkansas Library System. I would like to welcome you to tonight's discussion with Robin Spears titled Arkansas Aprons, Food Power and Women in Arkansas 1857 to 1891. This lecture is one of three lectures that are part of the Monday Matriarch series hosted by the Central Arkansas Library System as part of uh, Women's History Month. The previous lectures are available on the YouTube channel of the Central Arkansas Library System, and this one will be too in the near future if you want to view it again or share it. And if you want to visit the research room of the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art for your own historical or genealogical inquiries, we're open to the public right now, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to five. Tonight's speaker is Robin Spears, a doctoral student of history who researches 19th century women's history, food history, and medicine at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Following this presentation, we will have a brief Q&A. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn this over to Robin Spears. Thanks, Guy. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm honored to share with you uh, some empowering stories that highlight how separate households or groups of women implemented food power right here in Arkansas. Uh, food power is defined as a person or a group of people who use food exchange to change not only their standard of living, but also the course of events. <clears throat> um, much of Arkansas's food history remains to be written, and it appears to be an uphill battle to improve the narrative. Early travelers' accounts give, give Arkansas a bad culinary reputation. The voyagers complained of repeated fare consisting of cornbread and salt pork. The 1800s diet remained unvaried. This lack of variety in food preparation was noted in travel diaries of scientific gentlemen from the North. After they published their food complaints, Arkansas's poor culinary reputation is known to have reached as far as London. Uh, these winter video visitors only consumed cornbread and greasy pork meal after meal, which makes the reader wonder if their culinary reports might have been improved had they enjoyed a spring visit with a garden variety. It would not be until 1854 that a positive review would be published, and alas, only in German. <clears throat> Uh, we enter our first story in at a Calhoun County, Arkansas slave plantation in the 1850s. A locked cabin imprisoned six or seven young, hungry children. Ex-slave Augustus Robinson explained, all the littles were kept in one house when the old folks were working in the field. Meanwhile, grandmother Robinson worked in the house kitchen. This stellar grandmother, likely feeling powerlessness, knowing that her beloved grandchildren were starved and locked in a cabin without food, Grandma Robinson would hide kitchen food underneath her apron and carry it out to the children's cabin. Then she would there secretly, secretly pass the food through a crack in the wall to the hungry faces. Her grandson remembered she wasn't supposed to do it. But by carrying contraband food from the enslaver's kitchen to the children's cabin, Grandma Robinson exercised not only agency by practicing food power, but also a form of long lasting slave resistance. Grandma Robinson saw and felt the need to nurture her grandchildren. Her choice saved lives and changed the course of events. We travel now to Fayetteville, Arkansas in the late 1850s for our second story. The McCurdy women acted with food power to transform their household into a wartime supply factory. Mary Jane McCurdy Collins Weaver recalled, there was a smokehouse where we cured our bacon and put up our hog meat. 
We also used it for a general storeroom. Before Pa left, he got one of my mother's sisters to stay with us. At the beginning of the war, we had plenty to eat. Ma and Aunt Mag raised the garden and vegetables was plentiful. Then too, we had a good supply of meat in the smokehouse. Weaver's father, James Donald McCurdy, solicited his sister-in-law, Mag, to come and work with them. Men, women, and children knew the power found in female cooperation in food preparation, a form of food power. Weaver recalled the pain of watching her mother grieve the absence of her father. For two days, the women sat at home listening to the guns and cannons of what is believed to be the Battle of Prairie Grove, fought on December 7th, 1862. One can well imagine the feelings of worry, powerlessness, and grief, not knowing if your husband and father lived or died on the battlefield. What vehicle brought these powerless women the information they so craved? Food exchange. The McCurdy women took action and baked all the pies and cookies they could carry. When the gun stopped firing, the women with their horses carried all the food they could to the battleground. The wounded lay all over, propped up against trees, and some of them just sprawled out. Mother McCurdy hunted all over for her husband. When she finally found him, it was the happiest meeting that they had during the war, because she had thought he was dead. The women tended to the wounded and fed them first as long as the food lasted. Each injured soldier was given a piece of pie and a handful of cookies. When the supplies ran short, Weaver's mother saw many soldiers divide their own pie and cookies with those that went without. Weaver recalled, after they were fed, I think Ma got to talk with Pa only a little bit, but she come home happy knowing he had been spared. By carrying pies and cookies to the dying and the wounded, Weaver and her mother gained valuable, empowering information. Food power enabled them to help in the war effort at a time when women's military roles were quite limited. The battle resulted in a tactical stalemate that essentially guaranteed union control in Northwest Arkansas. In addition to engaging in food power on the battlefield, the McCurdy women treasured their kitchen tools. Of all the possessions her folks held onto in their move from Arkansas to Texas, they valued a frying pan and a skillet. Weaver remembered, when our folks got to Texas, I don't think they had a thing in the world, but a frying pan and a skillet. A skillet, you know, that was what they baked bread in. Generations later, Weaver continued to treasure a kitchen tool. She recalled a girl near her age giving her a little chicken that Weaver would raise to a beautiful hen. When Weaver's family moved, she traded the hen for a rolling pin. At the time of the interview with Weaver, that same dark walnut wooden rolling pin still hung on her kitchen wall. About the rolling pin, she said, all my children want it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I can't afford to cut it up and divide it. It was old and had been used lots when I got it and I have had it for 75 years. After I had used it about 74 years, it commenced to show some wear, and my son Lon sandpapered it down for me, and it is as good as new now. What treasure did Weaver prize highly and regard as an invaluable heirloom? A rolling pin. She craved connection to loved ones in food preparation, on the battlefield, in moving the family to Texas and in leaving a legacy for her children. Our third food power story continues at another Northwest Arkansas battlefield, the Battle of Pea Ridge in March of 1862. Also known as the Battle of Elkhorn Tavern, the Union drove Confederate soldiers into Northwest Arkansas. Confederate troops counterattacked, trying to recapture Northern Arkansas and Missouri, Union forces stopped the Confederate attack. This Confederate defeat secured Union control in most of Missouri and Northern Arkansas. 
Mary Elizabeth Wardlow's home rested directly in the path of Union soldiers. After the feds gathered up all of Wardlow's chickens, they demanded she cook them to feed Union soldiers. Staunchly Confederate, Wardlow did cook them. Feathers, entrails, and all. This form of rebellion against the Northern Feds could only come through food power. Wardlow took advantage of the presumptive female role as cook, defied orders from Union soldiers and resisted the invading army. We move east to the Arkansas Delta along the Mississippi River for our fourth story in another Confederate household. It is here that we will discover how the Southern slave owning society was dealt a major blow due to the loss of food power among plantation mistresses during the war. 47 year old Mary Frances Sale Edmondson, a slaveholder, commenced her diary on August 26, 1863 in Helena Phillips County, Arkansas. She wrote, this old book, which has power to recall to me faces that were familiar more than 20 years ago and scenes that have occurred in North Alabama, Mobile, Mississippi, Louisiana, I now devote as a, as a sort of journal in my desolated Arkansas home beginning far down in the second year of the cruel war waged against us. According to Edmondson, the balance of the Civil War hinged on who had the most salt. She lamented the loss of it and fervently prayed that she would not have to cave in to her Northern enemy for want of it. She wrote of the dread that accompanied their need for basic necessities. She grieved that their needs might compel them to, quote, take the oath of allegiance to the Lincoln government. All of the co community's efforts to acquire salt had failed. Salt was so important due to the rampant need to cure hog meat. Hog meat, without the ability to cure pork, an Arkansas mainstay, a family could starve. In December of 1863, Arkansas experienced a severe lack of food and an increase in the number of men away from home. During Christmas of that year, in one moment, Edmondson felt empowered by her ability to fill the children's stockings with care. The next moment, she felt compassion at the realization of who was not seated at the dinner table of her friend, Mrs. Robinson. She records, the previous Christmas, she, Mrs. R, had around her table seven or eight young people at dinner, her husband and brother also. Now of that company, four were dead in the bloom of their youth. Our darling daughter, Mary, Mrs. R's sister, Betty, Mr. R's cousin, Mr. Pruitt, and a soldier named Suggs. A consistent loss of food power debilitated Confederate women at home. Edmondson craved food security in a time of war. She knew the power of large gatherings at Christmas celebrations. By witnessing the drastic drop in the number of young people around the Robinson dinner table, Edmondson experienced a decisive blow to her community. Arkansas slaves particularly considered uh, popularly considered as black family members by the slaveholding white population, fled slavery when the Union Army was near, revealing what the ex-slaves valued most, freedom. Edmondson's entries reinforce a sense of powerlessness when certain foods like tools are unavailable. Powerlessness at the inevitability of the loss of a war and the loss of black family members and powerlessness when the number at the Christmas table diminishes. Clearly a growing lack of food power in Confederate households influenced the course of the war as more and more women pined for their men to be at home. After all this talk about Confederate women, 
What about union women? It may surprise you that although Arkansas sided with the Confederacy, many notable Arkansans fought for the Union. Following the 1863 fall of Little Rock to Union forces, Arkansans loyal to the Union formed four infantry regiments, four cavalry regiments, and an artillery battery. In addition, African Americans formed six Union infantry regiments and one artillery battery. One African-American soldier remembered a powerful movement of Arkansas women working tirelessly for Union victory. For story number five, we move west 100 miles to Pine Bluff, Arkansas to discover food power among Union women. African-American Henry H. Butler fought as a Union soldier in the Civil War in the Battle of Pine Bluff on October 25th, 1863 near the county courthouse. Butler remembered a bitter Sunday morning. Both armies fought energetically until the fatigue of war set in. Butler recalled that when the battle seemed a hopeless struggle, there appeared on the field a large number of women who had organized themselves into squads. They were carrying small platforms, two to a platform, upon which was coffee, sandwiches and other eatables. Butler, exhausted, watched these women as they went among the men feeding the soldiers. At the same time, these women warriors kept up a constant encouraging talk. Stand up to them, men. Be real men. Be whole men. Don't give up, fight them. Men, we are behind you. Show your stuff. Fight them to the last man. You have them whipped. Just stay in there and fight just a little longer. Butler emphasized, those women kept us fighting on into the night. And then the Confederates began to give ground, which continued into a general retreat. The Confederates had no sandwich squad. If anyone should ask you who won the Battle of Pine Bluff, Tell them that Henry Butler said that it was the women's sandwich squad that joined the Union forces armed with food and encouraging words. Butler does not indicate whether the women were black or white. By walking two by two and carrying coffee and sandwiches, these women delivered an influential blow against the Confederacy by exercising their agency through food power. Union forces successfully safeguarded the town against Confederate raids. The Union victory guaranteed the security of the garrison until the end of the war. We return now to Northwest Arkansas to a Carroll County Emancipation Camp toward the end of the war. Here, we see another example of how a loss of food power can be a stronger influence than a gain. African-Americans Elizabeth Holsey and her brother left the slave plantation to join the emancipation camp. The first night in camp, Elizabeth felt concern for the well-being of the abandoned plantation mistress, Mother Holsey. Elizabeth knew Mother Holsey was not only left alone with all the work and not a soul to help her, but Mother Holsey also endured a devastating blow when the blue coats had gone through the house and upset everything. The second morning in the emancipation camp, Elizabeth approached the camp's captain with just one request. She sought permission for herself and her brother to return for just a day to the plantation house to help put everything away and do the washing. The captain agreed to the plan, but knowing the danger involved, he gave them two words of warning. First, to return to camp by five o'clock, and second, to leave all of their children safe at the camp. Elizabeth and her brother agreed to the terms and walked back to the plantation house. While there, Elizabeth did all the washing, every rag that she could find, while her brother chopped and stacked all the wood that he could chop in a day. 
After finishing a long day of compassionate service, Elizabeth and her brother left the house for the last time to return to camp. Elizabeth would never forget the concern, worry, and grief demonstrated by the plantation mistress. Mother Holsey watched worriedly as Elizabeth and her brother departed. Wringing her hands and crying, Mistress Mother Holsey exclaimed, Oh Lord, what will I do? This former slave owner experienced extreme deprivation at her loss. The skills surrounding food were found in the slave woman, not the plantation mistress. The wringing of hands is evidence of the magnitude of the loss. While the freed slaves did take the time, the energy, the risk to return to minister to the former slave owner, they did ultimately leave the plantation to return to the emancipation camp. The freed slaves took their prized food power with them. Elizabeth and her brother wanted to return to the plantation house. These former slaves were free, yet they had compassion on their former owner. This is an enormous statement about the human condition during the war. As Arkansas continued its painfully slow recovery from the devastation of the war, over the course of the following decades, domestic landscapes transformed into small factories of the eggs and milk cash industry. Rural women relied on household garden pots and gathering eggs to facilitate trade with other women for their needs and an occasional luxury. These microeconomies empowered rural women to improve their circumstances, even when times were difficult or lonely. Our next story takes us to Clarksville, Arkansas. In 1890, where rural Arkansas women viewed rituals surrounding food as meaningful symbols for healing after childbirth, improving marriages, and strengthening bonds of female friendship. Born December 30th, 1848 in Port Jervis, New York, Sarah Jane Hazen married Corey Rhodes, a church minister. The family moved from New York to Johnson County, Arkansas. Unlike other diaries that have been copied or edited by family members, Rhodes' two diaries show her original handwriting. Each predated page measures approximately three by six inches and covers the years 1890 to 1891. Imagine a three by five card for each day of your life. What would you write? The pages are small, so her written words are limited. However, there seems to be much to read between the lines. As it is literally a daily diary, we see the ups and downs of food power. Her Wednesday, January 1st, 1890 entry quoted Mrs. H.R. Brown. Look forward and not back. The traveled track bears many a footstep thou wouldst fain retrace. Press onward to the goal, the homeland of the soul, and leave the wayward feast for God's hand to efface. She followed the quote with scripture. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and he will direct that path. Bible. It is interesting that Rhodes attributed her scripture simply to Bible, because she wrote the scripture incorrectly. She combines Psalm 37, five, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass with Proverbs 3, six. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Perhaps she knew the Bible did not say exactly those words. Still, they were somewhere in the good book. Regardless, these scriptures clearly resonated with her. The dinner table represented cohesion, not only for the family, but also for bodily healing after the trauma of childbirth. On Thursday, January 9th, 1890, Rhodes began her first diary entry. Francis is three weeks old today. I went to the table for dinner for the first time. This Rhodes' first daily entry centers on her presence at the dinner table. It also tells the reader that Rhodes' childbirth 
on December 10th, 1889 with little Francis was quite traumatic for the 41 year old mother. She associated recovery with the ability to sit at the dinner table. And she had hope and determination for the future as she started a new diary. Rhodes entries do not tell the reader about the tragic losses of her older children, which poignantly highlights this watershed moment at the dinner table. These details must be uncovered by genealogical research. Arthur Melville Rhodes, Claude Merton Rhodes, Mary Lucinda Rhodes, Ada Dell Rhodes. Corey and Sarah Rhodes were no strangers to grief. Now, her four-year-old son Milton and newborn Francis were two more possible losses. Is it any wonder why she begins her diary with the words, look forward and not back? Rose's diary also exemplifies the power of food in marriage. In the first five months, her daily entries, January through May of 1890, in all of those passages, over the duration of 120 days, only two phrases does Rhodes underline. The first underline is found on February 22nd, right here, 1890. Previous to that day, Rhodes had recorded dozens of incidents of how and where she set the hens. Then she recorded, Corey sought a hen upstairs in the barn. She underlined the word sought. Apparently having her husband's help in domestic labor with food had enough significance for her to not only mention it, but to emphasize this act of endearment, a kind gesture from a husband to his postpartum wife. Was Rhodes smiling as she wrote the words, Corey sought a hen? It appears that this seemingly small act by her husband put her into good humor for the duration of the diary's entry. She follows this pointed sentence with a series of good news. We weighed baby today and he weighed 14 three quarter pounds. Corey tacking for paper. Milty is better. Corey went to Presbyterian dinner and bought dinner for us all. The entry began with her husband helping her with domestic food labor. Her new infant thrived weighing over 14 pounds at just over two months old. Her husband's paper business prospered. Her four-year-old son's health was on the mend and Rhodes did not have to make dinner. Her husband brought dinner home. Only good feelings exude from this diary entry largely due to food power. Food exchange also acted as a forceful tie in bringing women together in companionship and camaraderie. Rhodes' second underline is found on Thursday, April 24th, 1890. She wrote, Aunt Lucretia McKinnon, McKinnon called a while. I love her. Aunt Lucretia visited between breakfast with Brother Koontz and dinner after churning butter. Rhodes ended her happy entry with the proud news, took off a hen with 14 chicks. The following entry shows a dreary scene, rainy day. The 1880 census lists Lucretia McKinnon as a 57 year old white widow living in Sparta. 10 years later, a sage 67 year old matriarchal figure might be just what the doctor ordered. Rhodes had lost her father, Daniel Corwin Hazen of New York, just three months previous on January 14, 1890. Having a motherly visit might have helped heal her grieving heart. Our final food power story has to do with how white families relied heavily on black food power. Rhodes frequently mentions Josie in her entries. 
likely 22-year-old African-American Josie Calhoun. What does the diary tell us about black and white relations in this household? The entries from January to May 1890 are particularly intriguing. January 11th, Josie baked bread and did the usual work. March 24th, Josie came and John with her. She brought me a mess of greens. April 29th, lovely day, Josie went home. May 3rd, Josie went to town and each got a pair of shoes. May 4th, Josie had one of her sp 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 spells this morning. Roads depended on Josie. The May 4th entry is particularly intriguing. One common form of resistance by blacks to white supremacy was pretending to be ill. This age old tactic had been used for centuries during slavery. On May 3rd, Josie went to town with May Stone. Did Josie see someone in particular in town on May 3rd? If so, did they persuade her to an event the next day? And did Josie pretend to have a spell on May 4th to get out of work and leave early? Is Sarah mocking Josie when she writes sp 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 spells? Further study of the diary's entries might reveal more about Rhodes' reliance on Josie in domestic labor. Similar to Weaver during the Civil War, when Rhodes discovered her need for wool, she met her needs by using eggs as a form of cash to trade with other women. Rhodes needed to return to normalcy after childbirth. She needed help setting the hens during postpartum, and she needed another woman's friendship in a time of need. How did she answer these needs? Food power. By 1900, three of the four family members in the Rhodes household would be dead. Her son, Milton, would pass away three years after these diary entries. Her son, Francis, would pass away three years after Milton in 1896. 47 year old Sarah Rhodes would pass away only 13 days after Francis on April 2nd, 1896. Rhodes' widower, Corey, would remarry Elizabeth Mercy Reeves in 1898 and begin a new family. Without this treasured diary, we might only know Sarah Rhodes as the deceased first wife of a Union soldier and missionary. Rhodes would have no descendants to remember her as not one of her children made it to adulthood. Now we see patterns of food power weaving in and out of the pages, tying family and community relationships even tighter during a trying time in the state of Arkansas. Food power would persist in the 20th century. While men went off to fight in the two world wars, women went to work canning, storing, and rationing food supplies. During the depression, Arkansas women would find ingenious ways to stretch their pennies, exchanging domestic labor for a bag of beans, for example. A century later, during the COVID era, a global lockdown forced Arkansas families to become reacquainted with the kitchen. The concept of gathering the family around the dinner table became more important than ever as the world population was confined to the domestic sphere. What will food power look like as we emerge from this global pandemic? Will there be long-term societal changes regarding food from this outbreak? Future historians will be interested to research the history of what the unseen populations of families during COVID-19 accomplished in the realm of food power. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have, we, we have some uh, question or two in the chat, but first I'd like to ask you, because a lot's been written about how Arkansas doesn't seem to have kind of its own food identity. Right. And, and I, w I wonder if you have any thoughts on why that is. Yeah, I, um, so we moved here 
about four years ago coming from California. And one of my first concerns was food. So, so I actually researched it before we even came to Northwest Arkansas. And um, that was actually part of the draw um, is that it, it, it said it pulled in Midwest, Texas, you know, um, all of these other places came here to Arkansas. And so I view it as a melting pot, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing to have a variety. So, right. but, they, yeah. They, they I, say I mutts discovered. are the healthiest dogs. So I guess we're just the mud of the of the Americas, huh? <laughs> yeah. Right in the middle. You You had talked about food and food power in the Civil War. I wonder if you have done any research on reconstruction? Yeah, that's a great question. So in my studies, I did a, a whole seminar on the history of food power with Dr. Patrick Williams. Mm -hmm. And there is a dearth of information about reconstruction. That's why you see a little jump over into the progressive era because <laughs> there wasn't much that, that I found, but I don't, I think it's out there. It's just to be discovered. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, viewer questions regarding the reference to mess of greens, Josie's spell, March 24. Do you think those were foraged greens? I was wondering if you found any references to foraging in your sources. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I did not find any references to foraging, but it would make sense if they did, you know. What sort of greens would they have foraged? Well, I, I look at the... Uh, one of my girlfriends that's a native Arkansan, she explained that there's um, local green onions and chives and that it's a spring, you know, uh, tradition here to have omelets <laughs> or something like that. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Or poke salad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Poke salad. I've heard of that one too. Right. Or my wife and I were hiking the other day and we saw... It's a uh, violet wood sorrel that grows in the hillier regions. And, you know, it looks a little bit like a clover, but it's got a, a splash of kind of a lavender coloration to it. And it tastes like hibiscus. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. My husband just bought a whole book about edible plants there. Yeah. I think Arkansas is a good place for that. Okay. Let's get to the next question. Hello, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. I am an MA student at UALR writing a thesis about women and tomato canning during the first half of the 20th century. You'd mentioned an uphill battle in the study of food work in Arkansas. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, just the, the, first, um, the first evidence that we have of food history that we could find so far anyway, was um, gentlemen visiting from the north and from England and what they found was pretty dismal and so they reported in scientific journals that Arkansas does not make good food <laughs> so which I find ironic since we have such a French influence but they uh, published their works as far as London and so that's why I say it's an uphill battle to make it a positive I really enjoy reading happy histories and that's what I focus on so it was delightful to have these amazing, empowering stories after such a sad series of reviews in the 1850s. And, and it is interesting that we're such an agricultural state, but that agriculture hasn't trans transferred over into food culture. Right. That, you know, most of the agricultural staples we've been growing as vast cotton fields or, you know, monocultures of corn and soybeans. That right. It seems a lot of our, our land is for stuff to export elsewhere for some other purposes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next one. Uh, how did you find uh, original sources of these individual li individuals' lives? Oh, that's, that's a great question. And that's what I'm proudest of. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Um, Dr. Jeannie Wayne is my advisor at the University of Arkansas. And when I gave her my idea of diving into diaries, because I really love Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's work on Martha Ballard, and I wanted to do the same thing that Laurel Thatcher Ulrich did for Martha Ballard to Arkansan women. And so Dr. Wayne gave me the assignment that she gave me a deadline. She said, this week, 
you need to get down to the state archives and find at least five diaries. And so I drove from, you know, Northwest Arkansas down to Little Rock to the state archives and I was able to dig in and spend a couple days pulling diaries and just looking for food. Um, the Rhodes diary for me was one of the biggest finds because it's original handwriting. It's not been edited by family members, um, but that's an untapped resource. I mean, you, there's a plethora of finds there that you could just go on and on and you know, you could lose yourself there for years. <laughs> so it's a happy place. Um, the first story you discussed where the enslaved woman snuck food to her grandchildren, Explain how we might see that food power. Yeah. So the definition of food power is a change of course of events through food exchange or an improvement of a standard, standard of living. And so the food exchange that took place there is a grandma carrying contraband food from the kitchen and exchanging it to her grandchildren who were starving in the children's cabin while all of the adults were away working. Um, and so that exchange likely saved lives by feeding these children. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was very common? That's a good question. Um, I think carrying contraband food was common. Um, mm -hmm. the, a lot of the research that I found actually took more um, hunting than contraband food. They, they would hunt at night, even when they weren't allowed to, to get food to supplement their diets for their children. And when that was discovered, then they tried to do it more you know undercover but um they, they were very resourceful in the ways they they supplemented their diet okay um one person writes i'm curious because of my limited uh, back to the foraging curious because of my admittedly limited reading about foraging and some argue that well-to-do white people would not forage perhaps it was unacceptable to eat if it was brought to them so i mean do, do you find class differentiation yeah that's a good question or is that um something yeah, for I, research? I don't know yeah I, I i didn't see anything about that i mean i i think it would make sense that the the garden plots for more well-to-do people would be more abundant mm -hmm. but i think also depended on the era and the the sources you know um the Civil War was the most devastating event to take place in Arkansas. So I don't know if that affected foraging or not. Mm -hmm. um, those are good questions. Okay. Uh, the food at the post was inferior to that at Hopefield in the colonial period. Also, Huckabees were once very common, a Batesville Civil War story, but hard to find now. That's from Arkansas historian Michael Dugan. Thank you. Um, would you care to speculate what happens to food power in the so-called food deserts of the late 20th and 21st centuries? Um, what, I don't understand the food deserts. It, these, these are areas where they don't have like their own grocery store or, you know, outlet to purchase food within a particular radius. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some rural areas are called food deserts, but also some parts of cities can be food deserts if, you know, they're poorer places where no one's locating a, a grocery store. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that goes back to the resourcefulness of, of Arkansas women. Uh, they, what, what they had, they used, <laughs> and they were very resourceful. So they would, you know, trade a bag of beans for what they needed. Okay. Oh, I think I think we're at the end of end of the Q and A. I I have one one last question. Oh wait, we we've had a uh, foraging war years were challenging, but also the Reconstruction years were awful. So getting food, however, had to be okay, right? Slaveholders' wives may not have had skills to grow gardens, and later years perhaps too infirm. So just a comment there. Um, so what's what's your future angle of research? Um, well, I, I really love the concept of food power. And so I'm taking that and moving it from food to medicine and I'm calling it healing power. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm focusing now on women in early Mormonism. They were called as healers and they eventually ended up using medicine as well. In the 1870s, Brigham Young sent them to schools in the East to become MDs, to come back and save lives in Utah territory. So that's my next project. But I mean, th- there's a lot of overlap between food power and, and medicine. I mean, if, if you get sick, they tell you eat chicken soup, you know, or yeah. all sorts of, you know, echinacea tea. I mean, it's food yeah. is the, the first medicine. Yeah, yeah just uh, the first story that I start with in, in my next project actually takes place on an island 350 miles south of Tahiti in 1844. And it's what you're talking about, Guy. Um, it's these native... Tahitians, it's called an island of Tuboi, and they're battling between faith healing and using ink to save a child. And so you just see this balance between faith and science, the mm-hmm. science that they have as their, you know, their folk healings um, on this Tahitian island. But um, anyway, it goes back to early Mormon missionaries in the Tahitian islands in the 1840s and and how they reconcile faith with the science of the islands. But um, you're right, there's a lot of overlap. It's a, a lot of the same sources. I'm using diaries, you know, and mm-hmm. reports and newspaper reports. And it's, it's good. We, it's we good. do have one last question. Okay. Is it food power when a Northeast Arkansas woman who got a job and announced that her days in the kitchen were over, it was TV dinners thereafter? <laughs> Yes, there can be a, a lack of uh, food power too. Um, I think that when we resort to dinner, uh, you know, TV dinners, that's also a different form of food power. Right. That's that's sort of the. If well, I I just know that you know my my dad retired and I think was expecting my mother to cook at the same level she had been. And, you know, she's retired too and has the feeling that if he wants it, he can fix it himself. So, (laughs) yeah, when I was defending my thesis to doctors Wayne, Williams and West, uh, Dr. West made the point that they'd been eating Eureka pizza. This was right after lockdown. This was about a month after lockdown last year. And he said his form of food power is found in Eureka pizzas. (laughs) There you go. Well, okay, we've really enjoyed this. Um, thank, thank you so much for being here and talking about this. And you know, maybe after the pandemic's over, we can uh, have you down here to give a you know not just lecture but also a cooking tutorial. And I would be honored. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoy talking about this, so I appreciate it. And to everyone watching this, this will be available on YouTube here soon. And all the previous lectures are also available there on the channel of the Central Arkansas Library System. Again, Robin Spears, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being here. Uh, for having we me really guys. enjoyed this and good luck with all of your future research and writing. Thank you.